A very pleasant good morning to everyone. These devotions are brought to you by the Anglican Diocese of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. My name is Father Roderick Bain, the rector of St. Barnabas Church in New Providence, Bahamas. Today we are observing the visitation to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The colic for today is found on page 185 in our Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, by your grace, the Virgin Mary, the mother of your incarnate Son, was blessed in bearing him, but still more blessed in keeping your word. Grant us who honor the exaltation of her lowliness to follow the example of her devotion to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The scripture for today is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 36, verse 39 to 56. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zachariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, and he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained there with her about three months and then returned home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. I speak to you now in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some words from Mary's Song of Praise, the Magnificat, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 48. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. He has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Whenever we look at the story of Mary, we must understand it through the telescope of the Incarnation. We also look at the Incarnation through the eyes of faith, where we observe that for us and for our salvation, God did many things so that we can be at a better place. Long ago, when our salvation history started, after the displacement or the entrance, as it were, of sin into this world, the displacement of man from God and the thing that separated man from God, we may say that it began in the Garden of Eden or that sin that Adam committed. But nonetheless, as human beings by nature, because of our sinful state, we are always in need of God. We are in need of getting to a better place. We are in need 
of salvation. And the story of Mary, indeed, the whole story of our salvation history, only makes sense when we level with ourselves and say that we are in need of a Savior. We are in need of God, that we are persons or beings that have become defiled, and we have erred and strayed, and everyone, as Scripture would say, have gone his or her own way that we are not what we should be, that we have lost he was at our center, that we have displaced or misplaced or replaced the center of who is supposed to be at the center, that is God himself. And now we are in a lost state. It is in this sense then uh, that the salvation of mankind makes sense. A sense also where we as human beings recognize that we have no power within ourselves to help ourselves and that we are definitely in need of a higher power to redeem us. The salvation of mankind has been one that God has always been involved in. Indeed, the whole history of our salvation is wrapped up in man's understanding of himself, while at the same time, man's understanding of God. And throughout the scripture that we have, the Old Testament, intentionally places us in a place where the experience of a mankind, the experiential, experientialism of a people, led them to an understanding that it is their dependence and their reliance of, on God that will help them to be a better people, the people of Israel. So the Bible in the Old Testament takes quite a long route in showing how God dealt with his chosen people and how they too had to depend and rely on him in many ways, of how they fell away many times and were brought back to this understanding of their necessity for God, of how the prophets played an integral part in reminding people of the covenant that God had made with them and of how they had to be reminded that this, this journey is not one of theirs, but one that God is leading them on. It led to, of course, the utter dependence on God. And whenever they fell away from depending on God and rely too much on themselves or their society, we realized that there was judgment and damnation to the nation. But later, throughout the salvation history of us as mankind, we realized that God, in still a greater way, revealed himself in Jesus Christ, the sending of his Son into this world, the incarnation of our God, God becoming man, dwelling with us, enjoying or living within our time and in our space, and living within our very existence. And this in itself should not ever, ever be taken lightly, because this is indeed a wonderful movement of God within our space and within our time. So great it is that it is a preparatory period that is needed and a humanistic element that is there for us to see the realism and the realistic picture that is placed on the important event of the Incarnation. Many of us may look at the Incarnation as one of the great mysteries of the Church. Thou art here, we ask not how. Jesus was in this world, in the person, and we don't know how. Uh, some people may say, don't question that, Father, don't bother with it, just leave it just like that. But in order for us to appreciate this visitation to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to appreciate the Blessed Virgin Mary, and to appreciate the human birth, that God could have taken any route into this world as he wished and as he liked. But there is an element of realness that we sometimes miss that though God is powerful, he's omnipotent and omnipresent, that he still is real. And he presents this realness in a real birth story, a presentation, as it were, an annunciation to a real young lady who in her virginity and in her state had this real encounter with an angel and she had this real discourse in which she was taught or told, or it was announced to her as we today observe, that you will have the Christ child. 
It is the attitude then of Mary in which she could have said, no, not me. I have my whole life ahead of me. I have things to do. I'm not bearing any strange child. You're not going to use my body for anything. And I need something for doing this. You have to pay me for doing this. None of these things were wrapped up in the realism of the story. But what is in the story and what is drawn out from the story of this visitation is the degree of acceptability by the message that was given to Mary. Mary had to have been in a place where she was accepting to the word and to the will of God. As we look at the story then, there is something that is called your existential predicament or your existential positionment that where you are at in life right now oftentimes is dictated to by the way you think of your world and the way you think of yourself. How you realize yourself impacting this world and what you may have in this world. Our predicament may be whether or not we are of high estate, low estate, or we are people who can actually make different changes in this world we are able to be those persons who are transformative. But whatever it is, it comes from the consciousness that we are a part of a vocational history and a vocation that is wrapped up more than who we are. But we have an opportunity to join in with God and to say yes to God in every moment. The tragedy is that many of us are not at that place where we are accepting to what God is saying to us. We are not open. And like the fields that you plant seed in, we are not fertile in a sense. We cannot accept anything that is said to us because we are not at that spiritual place that we should be. Mary was called great as a woman, and she was blessed in her womb because of her acceptance to the words and to the will of God in her life. Why are we then so resistant or not accepting to the will and to the way and to the words of God? Why then are we so closed or we find ourselves not listening or wanting to hear the will and the words and the desires of God in our lives? And a lot of this is because we in ourselves are very much unlike Mary. We become people who are focused on our own will, our own way. We are advancing ourselves. We are promoting everything about our own selfish ambitions. And we perhaps do not see or present ourselves in a way that we are accepting. We are fertile And we are saying, here I am, Lord, as Mary said, let it be to me as you say. I think we need to understand that nothing great happened with the attitude of selfishness. Mary was selfless in every which way. In fact, so selfless that it's because of her her acceptance, her saying yes to God, meant now that God could have used her to cause his very Christ child to be born. And this is powerful because whenever we say yes to God, God can cause his very will, his very act, his very presence to be born out in our lives. Our lives then become that womb or that place where godliness can be given birth where Christ-likeness could be born out, and where all that is godly can come into this world. But it starts with a spirit of acceptance. God could have broken into Mary's life and just say, here, this baby is in you, and that is it. She would have had no choice in the matter. But God more or less gave her a choice, and he gives her an opportunity, and the angel had a discourse with her, that went the way that every discourse with God should be. A discourse where we recognize that God is God, be still and know that God is God, and we are his creatures, that we should find him necessary and he should be essential to everything that we do, but more so that his will, his word, 
and what he says to us should impact us in such a way that we should be happy and grateful and honored to carry it out. Mary then shows us in a wonderful way today as we look at this great story, a wonderful attitude to embrace so that godliness and all that is God can be born out in our lives. She says that God has taken the lowliness of her as a servant, and indeed from that day on she will be called blessed. All generation will call her blessed because God the Mighty One has done great things for her. My hope and my prayer is today that as we look at the, the Annunciation to the Blessed Virgin Mary, we think of what it is to be open and receptive to God, of what saying yes to God can actually do in your life and in our world, of how that can transform our whole world just because of us saying yes to him. I do hope that we become impregnated with the things of God and that God himself plants himself into us, that as we become God bearers in our day and in our age, that God may truly be born out in our lives. This is my hope and my prayer for us this day, I pray. In his name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty then, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you this day and remain with you now and always. Amen. This brings this devotion to an end. Please do have a good day and share this devotion with a friend so that they too may be encouraged. God bless. Thank you.